indeed we are seeing. So the floor is all yours. You can formally proceed with okay. the presentation now, sir. Okay. I see there's a bit of a lag, so I'll just let me know if I'm getting ahead. Okay, thank you, Ali, and thanks to the Medina Institute for organizing this session. Thank you to everyone for joining um, Europe, Middle East. I think some people from California are waking up and, and joining us. Uh, feel free to just type in your city right now if, if you can, so I'll, I'll know where people are. Just, just type in your city. Um, it's the end of the day for many people in Europe and the Middle East, and I'll be presenting some very challenging material today. Probably focus on the hardest part first to get that over with. Um, I'll probably speak for about an hour, uh, a lo little longer than, than Ali had said, and, uh, and then I'll take questions. Try not to worry about all the details. You're going to see a lot of material today. Just want to give you a feel for business agility and participate in the exercises, and then we'll take questions afterwards. So. Okay, David. Uh, just uh, just to uh, name a lot of these. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but we have uh, people writing in from um, Istanbul, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, to Jeddah, to Riyadh, to Los Cato, California, <laughs> to Cairo, and all the way people are here. So, <laughs> wow, that's great! All over the world. Yeah. Okay, uh, you know some of these webinars are distant and impersonal feeling, and so I took this picture just a few hours ago of me and my little boy before I took him to school, just just so you have some sense of who's talking and that I'm not wearing my pajamas. Um, I've done a lot of consulting and strategy work. I've, be call, I've been called a futurist, and now I've come to the conclusion that most of that stuff is worthless. It's great for the consultant, but bad for the client. And that's why I developed business agility, the antidote to business consulting and forecasting. Let me start with a question. Are you, is this screen keeping up okay? Is there a bit of a lag between the We are reading um, the quiz stereotypes right now. I think there's only two okay, seconds three second delay perhaps. So. Okay. So if you live in the Middle East, do you think many Westerners have an inaccurate stereotype of pe business people in your country? Do they have a distorted view of who you are and what business is like in your part of the world? It's, not, it's probably not that realistic, and it's not fair, is it? And yet we all have these distorted views of people in other cultures far away from us. We use stereotypes because we don't have a grasp of the reality. We don't have anything better than a distorted view. So when we talk to each other, are we really speaking the same language? Is there a universal language of business? You know, it seems like, it, it seems like there is. When you and I talk about business, it seems like we're talking about the same th things and can reach a clear understanding. But is that true? Is there a single common language of business? Here on the left, I've listed areas where pretty much everything is relative to your worldview, and you can have your own opinions. On the right, the facts are in front of everyone, and so the language becomes more universal, more absolute. Now, I put science on the left, and I'll explain that later. But where is business? My goal today is to show that there is no clear language of business, no common language of business. And when we talk and agree on a business concept, we are both adding differently to our own mental models, which are made of our history and personalities, our distortions and biases. We can only operate within our minds, and our mental models aren't as accurate as we think. We all speak with an accent. And I'm not going to change that one bit. My goal is to make you aware of our shortcomings and investigate how we can build patterns of behavior that lead to better outcomes. So this is business agility. It's a framework that helps you follow your customers rather than predict where markets will go. Business agility replaces strategy with experiments, measurement, evidence, and good decision making. Now, the Medina Institute has already hosted a series of excellent webinars on decision making. It seems like the, the world's best decision makers and coaches are, are already making and will make future webinars with the Medina Institute. They're all on YouTube, and I'm not going to go into that area today. I highly recommend that you spend some time watching those important videos by some of the best decision scientists in the world. 
Now here are some of the topics from Business Agility, many of which have their own books dedicated to them. A few people will notice there's a green monkey eating an orange banana. Now we could spend a couple of years discussing these topics. Almost every one of these topics has a full book devoted to it. But in the next hour or so, I'm going to give a brief overview of a handful of these, and then we'll come back to that list, and I'll ha be happy to take requests and questions. So don't worry, worry, the list will be back. Before we get started, I have a question for you. What color is the monkey, and what is he eating? Some people will understand this, and some people won't. Just a minute ago, I mentioned a monkey. If you know the answer to the question, that's pretty good. Because while you were looking at these list, the list of topics I gave before, I said, a few people will notice there's a green monkey eating an orange banana. Did you hear that? It's likely a lot of people didn't, because our visual systems trump all the other senses. And your cognitive energy was in full use, scanning the list of terms. And that leads us to our first discussion item, and that's system one and system two. So let's do it with an exercise. Let's suppose I make you an offer. We'll toss a fair coin, and if it comes up heads, I'll give you $200. And if it comes up tails, you give me $100. We're only going to do this once. This is for real money, and I'm offering it to you right now. The question is, what is the expected outcome of this bet, and do you take it? You don't have to type your answer, just think about it. Heads, you win $200. Tails, you lose $100. Do you take this bet? Well, now let's try something a little more complicated. It's a variation on the same theme. This time, I'll let you draw one ball out of a bag containing nine black balls and one red ball. If you draw a black ball, you pay me $100. If you draw a red ball, I'll give you $1,400. Again, this is real money. I'm offering it to you right now, and we're only going to do it one time. Note that your odds of losing are $100 are 90%. Same two questions. <clears throat> What's the expected outcome, and do you take this bet? You don't have to type your answer. Just think about it. This is a harder question, isn't it? All right, I'm not going to give you, it's not going to be fair. I'm not going to give you enough time to really work this out. I'm going to go back and we'll, we'll figure it out together. Uh, when we go back here, uh, heads you win $200, tails you lose $100. Let's figure out the expected outcome. The expected value of a single bet here is the way you figure it out is you win 200 the first time, you lose 100 the next time. That's a net gain of 100, but we've done two times. So it's a net gain of $50 per trial. So the expected outcome for a $100 bet is $50 plus. Do you take this bet? I imagine most people said yes. You probably would take a bet where you have half a chance to lose 200, 100, but half a chance to gain twice that much. One way to look at this is that the person on the other side of that trade is a sucker. So in this case, I'm the sucker, because I, the more I do this, the more I lose, the more you do this, the more you'll win. Even on a one-time basis, I'm the sucker. Now we go back here. Here's a, black, a, ball with nine, a bag with nine black balls and one red ball. You take a single ball out of the bag, you are 90% to lose $100. What's the expected outcome? Well, let's see, nine times out of 10, we're gonna lose $100, that's $900 we've lost. Then on the 10th time, we, got, we get a red ball and we gain 1,400. That's a net of $500 gained over 10 times. Have to divide it by 10. Again, $50 expected outcome. If you got that in the time I gave you, <clears throat> Congratulations, you have a, a mathematical mind. Do you take this bet? We have the same expected value, but different odds. The odds are different this time. Here's how you know whether you should take this bet or not. 
once again, because the expected value is $50 to you on each throw, on each draw, I am the sucker. The person on the opposite side of this trade is a sucker. The answer is absolutely yes, you should take this bet. <clears throat> now, this even extends to the case where it's a million to one and you have a chance of you know almost a million to one to lose a hundred dollars, but one time out of a million you'll make enough money <clears throat> to give a fifty dollar expected outcome, you should take that bet. Uh, there are formulas that help you understand how often you should take that bet, but you should still take the bet if the expected outcome is fifty dollars regardless of the odds of winning. Now that's not intuitive. In fact, you may have already intuited the other the flip side in the case of the lottery. Most people in the case of the lottery, most lotteries, you pay a dollar and your chances of, and your expected outcome is 20 to 50 cents on the dollar. So 20 to 50 percent return on every dollar you bet on the lottery. That's why smart people don't play the lottery. You have a negative expected outcome. And this introduces system one and system two. System one is the way we think most of the time. System one has a tendency to be first. It also has a tendency to assure us that it knows what it's doing and it's confident, it's quick, it's lazy, it's emotional, uh, it only deals in concrete things that it can see right in front of it, and it loves shortcuts. This is how we operate almost all of the time. System two, on the other hand, if you've, if you've read uh, books like Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman, is, is uh, slow, it requires effort and reason, it's cautious, it takes serious analysis, it's non-intuitive, and it's, it can handle abstract con concepts and it can also deal with uncertainty. System two is hard. Uh, we don't use it very much and in fact we get ourselves in trouble making some of our, of our biggest mistakes when we think we are using system one when in fact we are actually substituting. We think we are using system two when in fact we are actually using system one. We're going to learn about system one and use system, system two and try to use system two as much as we can as we do as we explore business agility. So that's system one and two. That's a very brief overview. There are many books on those, that topic. And now let's look at black swans. I'm sure some people are familiar with black swans. According to Nassim Nicholas Taleb, we can look at the world using two main kinds of outcomes, the simple and the complex, and two kinds of probability distributions normal distributions and power distributions. Now I have a segment on Bayesian analysis that I'm going to save for later, but, but I, I assume that people have some idea of, of normal statistics. And uh, it's important to understand that Bayesian statistics requires system two and requires effort. But just, let's just look at a few examples from these four quadrants of Taleb. The important thing here is that when you have situations that have complex outcomes governed by a power law, you are out of the realm of statistics and you cannot predict the future. So what does that, what are the examples in these categories? So, so in simple normal outcomes we have a lot of simple things that uh, uh, happen fairly predictably in simple power laws, we have things that happen unpredictably, but we can get a handle on them and we can at least measure these things and model them. In the complex area, we have normal distributions, which is the Bayesian area, and that applies to a lot of single things, a single person, or maybe a single measurement like, a, like, like height uh, or or, but not how people interact, a single product and its dimensions or its, its attributes, people and their attributes, but not how they interact. Down in the right-hand corner, we kind of have a lot of things that we encounter every day, you know, how, how markets interact, crowds, pandemics. These are the effects of things are very, very, are impossible to predict. 
um, we can model them and often the models are wrong. This is the area outside of statistics. Now, on a frequency basis, looking at the frequency day to day, Bayesian problems dominate. This is why it's important to learn about rationality, which uses Bayesian logic to sort of navigate the small decisions you made every day. I highly recommend everybody here take a full course on Bayesian reasoning, probably once a year, because it seems to, uh, to wear off over time. On the other hand, the power law effects with simple outcomes should really be left to statisticians. It's, it's far too difficult for us to work with power laws in our everyday lives without a lot of specific training. And the black swan domain, well look, we hardly ever see it, so it's really not very frequent. It doesn't come up very often. But let's look at impact. When we look at the impact of these outcomes, the black swan dominates. Rare events that could have a huge impact are outside the realm of statistics, but we need to be aware of them and prepared for them even if we can't predict them. That means we can't model them. We have to be prepared for anything. So I claim that we should have in business, in economics, in government, in our personal lives, we should try to balance a Bayesian view of the world and a black swan view, almost all of which uses system two and no system one. And this ties right into portfolio theory. There are a couple different ways to do it. Nassim Taleb would argue that since 80 or 90 percent of the, of the impact is due to black swans, you should spend 80 percent of your time looking at possible black swan effects and how they can impact you. In other words, you should be a buyer of insurance, not a seller. You should be a student of buying insurance and you should make Bayesian decisions uh, some of the time. On the other hand, you may want to consider more of a 20% black swan protection. And this is probably the barbell approach that many people and many businesses should take in most cases. Bayesian reasoning is for every day, assuming that tomorrow is going to look a lot like today. And the black swan perspective keeps you from getting your head chopped off when the world changes dramatically. There's nothing intuitive about any of this. Common sense plays no role in making important decisions. This is all system two, which means almost no one does it correctly. That's just an introduction to black swans, and now let's look at facts versus evidence. Facts are not evidence. Most people win arguments using facts. Uh, any presidential debate has ever been won using facts. Facts are cheap and plentiful, and while a given fact may be true, it almost never tells the whole story. Several facts may even line up coincidentally and tell a story that looks convincing. But evidence is different. When using evidence, you must include everything, and you can't be selective. And because evidence is messy and complicated, it often goes against common sense. Here's an example. For more than 30 years now, we've spent billions of dollars and instituted programs around the world to help give people the facts they need to make better eating choices. And yet, worldwide obesity has almost doubled. Are people ignoring the, the, the advice, or is there something else going on? Now, the theory is that if you consume more calories than you burn, you'll gain weight. And if you burn more calories than you consume, you'll lose weight. If calories in equals calories out, then your weight won't change. Now, this seems like common sense, doesn't it? The problem is the pesky evidence. It doesn't support the theory. 97% of people who try to lose weight fail, no matter what system they use. There are thousands of diet books espousing this theory, and many scientists have tried to show that the theory must be true, but humans keep on gaining weight even when they consume fewer calories than they burn. Here is just one piece of the puzzle. People in different countries consume different amounts, and yet some have seen huge increases in obesity, regardless of calories consumed, while others have not. What could it be? Could it be sugar, exercise, genes? The real answer 
is that we just still don't know. That's the real answer. We have a lot of clues. We know that the theory is wrong. We know that all the diet books are wrong. But we are far from being able to tell a specific person what to do to lose weight and keep it off. Anyone who tells you that really is not using an evidence-based approach. Now think about this. People with higher education have higher wages. Is that true? You can imagine what I'm going to say next. Since the 1960s, I'm sorry, I have to go back. Since the 1960s, countries have been investing in education, hoping to see a payoff in increased wages and productivity. Most countries have increased spending on schools for the past 40 years. How has that turned out? Well, here's what we know. Countries that invest in general education do not see an increase in productivity. In fact, many countries have experienced the exact opposite, that increasing general ed the general level of education has brought down GDP per capita even 20 years later. That's right. We see a slight negative correlation. And the trend is accelerating. Now here's, I'm sorry, I've got one, here we go. One researcher says, another troubling aspect of our results investigating this is that investment in human capital seems to have nothing to do with changes in growth rates over time. We're learning that we must redesign our educational systems around skills not knowledge, especially as the internet changes the very concept of knowledge. We'll see in a minute that this emphasis of skills over knowledge has a huge impact on companies, on human resources, and hiring. I don't have time to go into it, but we also have plenty of evidence that most management consulting doesn't help clients either. Now, there are many more examples of where common sense fools us and where we think one thing causes another, but it's very difficult to determine causality. Facts are not evidence. We need evidence-based thinking and an open mind to really understand the world. That's a short overview of facts and evidence. Let's see what we can learn about human resource myths. This is going to be fun. Here are some common human resource practices that don't work. These practices have almost no correlation to employee happiness, effectiveness, or retention. Traditional interviews end up hiring people we happen to like or people who are similar to us. School doesn't matter at all. We have suspected for a long time that an MBA doesn't matter, and now we have, and now some MBA students have found good evidence that the school you went to and the degree you got really doesn't matter to your work performance. We're starting to gather more and more data on what really works in HR and what doesn't. We don't have all the answers, but we have much data from Google and from a few other companies. We are really starting to measure this stuff carefully. Here are some practices. I'll just uh, sketch out a few practices that are more strongly correlated with employee satisfaction and effectiveness. Uh, let me just take, um, here I'll outline hiring performance and pay. These are things that, that have a better chance of working. And I'm going to just uh, drill down on these three things. At Google, a team of five to seven people will interview you for a given job. Not just the people you'd report to, but others in different departments since they've learned that people switch jobs within about 18 months of being hired. After all the interviews, that team meets with another separate team and transfers all their interview information to them without mentioning sex, height, hair, charm, schools, any other thing that they know doesn't matter in interviews. And it's the second team that makes an impartial hiring decision with much less bias. In some Google buildings, they do this in a room that, is, that has many psychological biases written on the walls as reminders. Now, for performance reviews, it would, it's simple. It would probably 
be better to play a nice game of cards or watch some TV together than do performance reviews. That's, that's all we know about that. And we've known for years now that people don't work for money. Once they have a certain level of comfort and security, more money does not incentivize people to work harder. Performance pay doesn't work. Paying according to business results subjects people's pay to the randomness of the marketplace. But at Netflix, their philosophy is to always pay top market rate at all times. They encourage their people to go out and interview and see what they are worth in the market. Rather than matching it at the last second when the employee announces that he's going to leave, they try to pay that rate all the time. What about vacation pay at Netflix and how many hours employees should work? Here's how they do it. At Netflix, one of the best rated companies to work for in the United States, there is no policy on hours worked on when you should show up and when you should take a vacation. There's absolutely no tracking. They don't have that many policies at network at Netflix. They have values and they hire carefully. That's a brief overview of human resources and it ties nicely in with the next section, cognitive diversity. So let's go there. One of the tools we use to counter the effects of system one thinking is cognitive diversity. Surround yourself with people who aren't like you and force yourself to make important decisions in a group of five to eight. By getting more input, you'll have fewer extreme successes and fewer extreme failures. This particular system here is Myers-Briggs, but there are many more ways to find diversity. One of my personal favorites is birth order. If everyone in the room is first born, you should at least be aware of that. Um, this has cognitive diversity has nothing to do with physical <laughs> diversity. I'm sure you're aware of that. There's also a cool little uh, visual illusion here. Do you see it? Your brain makes the white circular area in the middle around the word you look lighter and brighter, and it makes the outside area look duller and more gray, but it isn't. See that? See how the white circle pops out as whiter and brighter? You know it's just an illusion, and yet you can't prevent it from happening. That's system one. You can't turn it off sometimes. So instead of performance reviews, here's an idea. Let each employee put her, his or her own board of advisors together and meet with them regularly. Uh, this is a common practice at companies that are flat, companies like LRN Consulting, where you are in charge of putting your own board of advisors together and consult them as you need them. Call a board meeting when you need it. You should also do this in your personal life for all your big decisions. Commit to something only if you can get consensus among your different advisors. Otherwise, let it go. Cognitive diversity <clears throat> saves lives and saves careers. Find people who think differently than you do. That's cognitive diversity. Now speaking of illusions, let's go to the illusion of control. The illusion of control is part of the fallacy of cause and effect. Let's suppose you go to a doctor for a checkup. Now statistically, you've already made a mistake. No healthy person in the world should ever go to a doctor. Checkups are a huge waste of time and money, and they are a drag on the healthcare system, and they help no one. If you're sick, you should wait as long as possible before seeing a doctor, because statistically, most things go away by themselves. Most doctors are overconfident and unable to do the math that will help patients. I can point you to the research in that area. Remember this. And this advice may save your life. If a doctor wants to perform surgery on you, never agree to any medical procedure without getting a second opinion from a qualified statistician. That should be worth the price of admission right there. But let's say you've made the mistake already. It's too late. The doctor's assistant is checking your blood pressure. Now, the doctor sees that your blood pressure is up from your last checkup five years ago. 
Could this be a trend? It could. Could your blood pressure? Your blood pressure is now just over the threshold, so your doctor prescribes antihypertensive medication. Six months later, ah, oh, your numbers look better and the crisis is over. A clear case of cause and effect, right? What would have happened if the doctor had done nothing? Well, for starters, blood pressure is quite variable over time. Getting measured every five years tells you nothing. Getting measured every year tells you almost nothing. Second, many people become a bit uncomfortable getting their blood pressure taken, which can skew the measurement right there. But statistically, given the two previous readings, what's the most likely reading on the third time? It's most likely to be somewhere between the last two all by itself without any intervention. But now you're taking a drug that could interact with other drugs or have side effects. You've been diagnosed as hypertensive, which could influence other diagnoses later, and you've cost the healthcare system thousands of dollars, all because you went to the doctor when you were healthy. This is the illusion of control. We do things, and later it seems that our actions had a direct effect, even though it was likely to happen anyway. We see it in stock market investing, mergers, management, and almost all areas of business. It's so prevalent that I could probably follow you around for a day and find half a dozen examples in your own business life. We're not aware of them. We think we have more control over the world than we actually do. That's the illusion of control. We've got three more to go. Let's look at leadership. Now, since people have been reading business books, authors have been claiming that there are certain characteristics that make a good leader. These books and authors are inspiring, factual, and wrong. Co the companies profiled in these best-selling books, millions of copies sold, later went on to underperform the markets simply because if you select a group of outperforming companies, they are more likely to revert to the mean than continue their streak. Clearly, we have a desire to know what makes a good leader so we can just do those things and be successful. But the world isn't that simple. Any business guru who gives you a list of leadership qualities is good at self-promotion and hasn't studied statistics. Most books are like most business books are like diet books. They give you facts, but they don't give you the evidence. I'll later show you a list of books that you may find helpful. Here's a guy who studies leadership, Jerker Denrell, and he concludes, studying leadership, he concludes, the organizations that can be observed at any point in time are survivors of a select process that has eliminated a large fraction of the underlying population. In addition, there is a strong tendency to focus on successful organizations in books and the business press. As a result, the available sample of organizations usually undersamples failure. This can contribute to a variety of false beliefs about effective management. He's being kind there. It actually pretty much does contribute to a variety of false beliefs about effective management. Studying leadership is like studying the winning strategies of roulette players at the casino. The same exact thing can be said about investing, in case you wanted to check your portfolio. That's leadership. Now we'll talk about hedgehogs and foxes. Philip Tetlock has been studying people's ability to predict the future, and he's learned that there are two kinds of people, the hedgehog and the fox. The hedgehog is the kind of person you see on TV or running for office, someone who has a position and conviction that he is right, someone who drives toward a singular goal without regard for what others think. In most cases, this is what we call a leader. But the person who actually gets it right far more often is the fox, someone who has many small ideas and makes progress in small steps, not in big jumps. A fox is happy to kill off anything that isn't working and adjusts his view of the world 
as he gets new information. Foxes are flexible and can respond to changes in the environment that would kill a hedgehog and often does. One emphasis of business agility is to surround hedgehog CEOs with foxes, foxy boards. Most hedgehogs are going to be, sorry, most CEOs are going to be hedgehogs. But too many boards are made up of people who are similar and who rubber stamp the plans of the hedgehog CEO. Or they bring in a new CEO who has a winning track record only to discover that streaks and swagger don't last forever. Let's be clear, hedgehogs change the world. Hedgehogs make great salespeople. Foxes are realists. They make better, more consistent managers. We need both kinds. But for every successful hedgehog, there are countless unsuccessful hedgehogs who are just as qualified but didn't get as lucky. Those hedgehogs who do get lucky and establish themselves as leaders tend to dominate their market by brute force. Those who work for them believe in the mission but often don't enjoy the process. When hedgehogs no longer dominate, they go home and play golf. Or for some reason, they buy huge yachts. I don't really know what the deal is with the huge yachts, but they correlate strongly with the blue list on the left. Foxes, on the other hand, are quiet, humble people, and they qualify their statements. They listen. They promote people. They are open to criticism. They tend not to get angry. They tend to start charitable foundations and work hard their entire lives. Which brain surgeon would you rather choose? The famous one who is sure of himself and quick, or the one who takes her time, talks about the possibilities, tries to quantify your chances, both positive and negative, and asks you to consider the option of waiting and encourages you to get a second opinion. Which brain surgeon would you choose? Which model do you think is better positioned for the 21st century? That's hedgehogs and foxes. We're doing pretty well on time, that's great. So let, let me see if I can, I hope I haven't gone too fast. I know it's challenging, but you'll be able to replay it later if you want. Finally, let's, let's just see some light at the end of the tunnel by learning about experiments. Strategic planning is an attempt to predict the future, and our biases prevent us from seeing how poorly we do when we predict the future. If the strategy doesn't work, just blame the execution. We now have a growing body of evidence that doing experiments is far more effective both inside and outside the organization. Scott Cook, chairman of Intuit, says, when people ask him his opinion, he just says, I don't know. How can we test it? For example, in Portishead, England, a small town was congested, loud, and dangerous because of an important regional road running right through their town. This is typical of many small and medium-sized towns. What did they do? They tried an experiment. They covered all their traffic lights and signs and took away all the rules. And guess what happened? Can anyone guess what happened? Every single measure, congestion, pollution, noise, accidents, injuries, and traffic deaths all improved. And they tried it for a couple of months. Until then, they made it final and took a, a crew through town and took out all of their signs. Now, over 20 cities in Europe have already removed all their traffic control signals permanently, and more are experimenting to learn what exactly works for their communities. They're learning that not one solution works for everyone. You have to try and see what works, depending on the layout of your community, the number of bicyclists, pedestrians, and, and the flow. But that willingness to try something crazy, try something experimental, is saving lives and improving life in cities. It's just the beginning of the shared space movement 
which has already come to London, by the way, in a few small patches, fewer rules and more individual responsibility are starting to show results. Actively thinking how you can try new things and actively making exploratory mistakes is one of the best things you can do to improve your chances of finding new business. So what are experiments? An experiment is done in the real world with real products and real customers, not focus groups. No questionnaires. No hypotheticals. Sometimes customers even pay good money for, for, their, for their experiments. The answer is not known beforehand. Experiments are not for validating your intuition, your gut, or your position. They are for asking open questions. An experiment without a control group and without rigorous statistical analysis is not an experiment. Most marketing experiments are not experiments. They are more validation for what management wants to accomplish. You can learn much more doing a real experiment when you hold all conditions fixed and change only one variable at a time. Changing more than one variable at a time requires a qualified statistician to design the experiments. Strategic planning can be valuable, but much of it can be replaced with experiments. Here's a great example. Michael Bloomberg in New York, currently the mayor of New York, when he was running his company, told his people he didn't want to see any plans. He wanted proposals for experiments on one sheet of paper. If your experiment was approved, you'd get $100,000 to show some results. If you got results, you got more resources. Most companies can replace at least 80% of their strategy work with experiments, leaving no more than 20% for future scenario planning. In fact, the two actually blend together quite well. Strategic planners can learn much from previous experiments of others. Many people here know, I just want to make sure, all Google employees get to spend 20% of their time doing anything they want. That is how most Google products get created. Tens of thousands of people doing just any old thing they want. When something catches a little momentum, uh, teams of, uh, resource of people will abandon their experiments and come find one that's working and add to it. So that's an overview of a few different categories, a few different of the, of the topics from my main list. I'm now going to give a quick tour of my website. This is businessagilityworkshop.com. Then I'll come back and, and summarize. At Business Agility Workshop, I, I'm not trying to promote here. I'm trying to sh give you some resources. So here's the book list. I've made a lot of claims in the last 40 minutes. If anyone wants to, you know, sort of discuss your opinion or really sort of count, challenge any of the claims I've made, which which would be fair, please just read all of these books first, uh, and then we can have an, a, a discussion about them. Um, many of the much of the data and much of the evidence for things I have talked about is in these books. Earlier, you remember I said that science is relative, and there's no common language for science. You're going to learn about that in this amazing book called Wrong by David Friedman. Uh, these are all links so you can get the books uh, this way or, or just use this as a reference. But Wrong will help you understand what is wrong with science. Uh, and that's the same with evidence-based medicine. Now, there are a lot of resources here. Uh, this is kind of a, 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 a treasure trove of mind-blowing, eye-opening, jaw-dropping websites and discussions and uh, research much about decision-making, which, which we know from uh, earlier uh, mile webinars. And uh, there's tremendous stuff here on self-governments, experiments, Bayesian reasoning, mindfulness, other things that, that showing to, to work. Uh, I just want, you know, no, almost nobody clicks on this, and I want to show you what happens when you you haven't been here before, but this is what happens when you click on this. I want you to be able to use it at any time. This is a resource I've built for anybody to use. This is a, a mind map 
of business agility, and uh, it's fairly fleshed out. Here, here are the cognitive biases. So if you want to sort of learn about all the cognitive biases at once, each one of these has a, a quick little explanation, and uh, just gives you kind of a feeling for uh, the map of all these cognitive cognitive biases here, stereotyping, and, uh, and there's actually quite a bit more than cognitive biases. There, there are lists of, uh, of uh, logical fallacies, there are quite a few here, and they're broken into different uh, groups. There are also consultants here, and many other resources, so if, you, uh, if you're interested, here's, a, here's all the decision scientists, there's tools, it's really a, something that I hope people will start to use, just, uh, just not discovered yet. Now I'm going to go back and just wrap up. Uh, here we go. Here again is the framework. This could be the new blueprint for following customers and becoming more agile. Companies that switch to this approach could have a huge advantage over their competitors. I would have said will have a huge advantage over a competitor because in my heart, deep in my heart, I'm still a hedgehog. And that's what I wrote. But then my, uh, my foxy nature came back and edited it to say companies that switch to this approach could have a huge advantage over their competitors because we don't have a ton of evidence yet for business agility, but we do have evidence for many of its components. So I hope I've shown that we all speak a different dialect of business. We all speak with an accent. And that may or may not accurately reflect the real world. And it may not be entirely coherent to other people who have their own mental maps. Gut instinct and common sense probably aren't the best way to run any kind of organization. Here is a quick summary. We can probably do with a lot less management we can probably replace most planning with experiments. We all have blind spots, even those of us who don't think we have blind spots, and even those of us who study blind spots. We still have blind spots, even though we know they're there. And they trip us up all the time. Saying, I don't know, is probably one of the sharpest tools in your toolbox. And the way out of these traps is to build support systems that help us use system two rather than system one so we can use the tools we have to our advantage. H. L. Mencken, I think, said it very well. For every complex problem, there is an example that is clear, simple, and wrong. Now, I want to leave you with a question. I'm, I'm sure you have questions. Here's my question to you. If everything I have said, or if just half of what I have said today is true, what would you do differently? Where would you start? This is a conversation I want people to have inside their companies after watching this. But I'm going to go back to the list now. And we can talk about anything anybody wants, even what color the monkeys are. Uh, my preference is to talk about questions about experiments first. If people have questions about experiments, if you want to know if we want to brainstorm or think about experiments, you could do. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about any of these. One final note, I, I have several more of these prepared and would be happy to roll into them and show a few more if anybody wants. Uh, you can tell me or you can pick some. And if I see people voting, you know, for a couple, for one, a couple of times, then I'll try to, uh, to do a little, you know, four minutes on on whatever people want to see. This is not a map. This is a list. Uh, there are plenty more. And uh, feel free to ask anything. OK. So we're ready for the Q&A, David? Sure. OK. Well, thank you very much, uh, David, for a lovely presentation and quite a paradigm for a lot of us, I believe. Uh, folks, now we're open for the Q&A. If you have questions, you could either raise your hand. Uh, there's a hand icon available on your webinar console. 
So if you click on it, I'll give you a chance to speak to um, David directly, or you could put your questions in the question box, chat box, and uh, I'll be happy to read them over on your behalf. Uh, I see there are a couple of hands already raised now, so let me move. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Rishad Faridi. Dr. Uh, Muhammad, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, uh, talk show about uh, uh, business agility. And in fact, it's uh, very much uh, what I teach my students here in this university at Riyadh about uh, supply chain management, where we have a lot of business agility that uh, focuses more on the cost, on the, uh, the speed of doing things. So I thank uh, the facilitator for uh, giving me this opportunity for asking a question. My question is that uh, in, in perspective of the supply chain management, uh, like uh, in fact it is a lot of perceptions taking place, but still do you think in complexities in supply chain management, uh, because it's more global, you think it, it, will it work experiments in that scenario like? It's a good question. Can we do experiments in supply chain management? You're, uh, you're applying some of the uh, methods of business agility already, so that's great. Uh, yeah. I, and and uh, the answer is you can always try experiments. I'm going to give you one example from my previous book All right. that has to do with the U.S. auto industry here. There was a group of auto industry people who got together and said, we have over 600 measurement systems for measuring right. all the different parts and things that it, the, from the entire supply chain of, right. the, uh, uh, of the auto industry. They did an experiment and they, they got together and hammered it down to 40, mm -hmm. to 40 oh, different right. systems of measurement and right. they decided to try it and what happened was they threw out whole rooms full of computers that were needed mm -hmm. to translate from one system to another and they saved, I think on the order of I don't remember what it was, $2 billion a year. Oh, it took, it took them about five years mm -hmm. to, get to, to get to where they were really saving, but, and it was hard, but it was certainly, right. and, and it wasn't that popular at the beginning, mm -hmm. but right. they made it happen. You can obviously try many smaller experiments and see the idea of experiments is that they don't cost much to try. So right, if, they don't, exactly. if they don't work, that's fine. You, know, you, yeah, yeah, you yeah. shouldn't experiment. You shouldn't expect that. You should expect that most of them fail, right? Right. Yeah. Because we uh, the term it's like we say the supply chain complexities, and when uh, when we think of uh, like for example the Walmart like global procurement. So uh, henceforth, when you, uh, more countries and more different cultures and overlapping right. and right. Uh, distribution complexities and so on and so forth happens, then uh, that uh, experiments. I, 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 you are absolutely right that uh, we can break it down and make it more sim similar. Uh, you know, make it think simple and. I think the solutions would be much easier. Well, uh, like I would say with any industry, get a group of leaders together and go through some business agility training. Go through not just the decision training, but training on right. experiments, training on making mistakes, mm -hmm. and get everybody right. on board to, to brainstorm on what kinds of experiments you could do and then try some as a group. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate your answer. Well, thank I, uh, you. I do. I'm interested in doing my little piece on luck. Uh, can I do my little piece on luck, and then we'll come back to questions, or do you want to keep doing questions? I'm I'm flexible. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, for your question. And uh, I'll well, you're the you're the boss, uh, David. So I'll let you. If you uh, want let me to do go. my piece on luck. I'm just uh, I I really want people to get all this. Right. I don't want to sure. miss it. Sure, sure. So, yeah. Let's so go. here's luck. This is four four minutes. Give me four minutes on luck. Michael Malbison is the chairman of the Santa Fe Institute, which I recommend everybody explore. He has written an important book on the role luck plays in business. He says that whenever you do anything in business, you're reaching into two jars and you're grabbing a marble out of each jar and the combination of the two marbles determines your outcome. So you can see that if you, if you Get, if you hit it on the luck side and you have enough skill or you manage to, the skill works out, then you'll have success. 
And if you only get one or none, then you will fail. Both are required. And if you're doing something highly repeatable and you have a lot of skill, then the two jars look like this. There's a lot of red balls to choose from, but there's always a chance. There's, there's a, usually a reasonable chance that, that you know, things won't go your way. But your chances of a good outcome are pretty high. Um, now, if you're doing something complicated, variable, and involving people and competition like we do in business, you're going to need a lot more luck to succeed. And this is true no matter how, skill you, how much skill you have. This has tremendous implications for people who think they can pick stocks or predict the future. And the farther into the future you aim, the fewer red balls you will have available. So to put it on a continuum, luck has far more influence on business than most people think. History and magazine articles are written about the winners, and few people understand how many qualified losers there are for every winner. Random chance explains a lot of our business results, and yet we want to explain it differently. We want a story. <clears throat> this is probably why so many managers play golf, because it's easier to be consistently good at golf than at business. Okay, I've, I've got a few more, but I'm, let's take some questions and see how it goes. So we are ready for the questions, Debbie? Sure. Uh, okay, folks, uh, let me see. There are questions. Uh, okay, we have a question from uh, Richard Lusting. Um, uh, the question is, hi, could you elaborate on the difference between your approach and the classic plan, act, check, or continuous improvement approaches from Six Sigma, etc., which are also focusing on statistical analysis? Sure. Great question, Richard. Uh, Six Sigma has been shown, and a lot of this classic management stuff has been shown, to work in very highly repeatable contexts of production lines or, uh, or manufacturing. It doesn't really work at all in most. The evidence is really against those kinds of uh, uh, approaches in anything having to do with any kind of creativity or, uh, or individual responsibility. Um, w w the most important difference is randomness, understanding and embracing randomness. Uh, business agility is by definition going to be messy. So we have a lot of the Six Sigma type of approaches and controlled in me control in medicine. And in most cases, in many cases, we are doing more harm than good. Medicine is a perfect example of how backward things have become and, uh, and how those processes have fossilized the wrong approach and are doing too much harm. This is true in most businesses now. Uh, we have to get much more stochastic and much more open to failure. Uh, it's, the, it's the foxy approach, not the hedgehog approach. Does that help? Written question, so before Richard nods it to yes or no, let me see. Uh, uh, he said, great, thanks. Uh, so we have an answer to it also. So let me move to uh, another question. Uh, this is again on the experiment. Uh, could you please explain how experiments cannot be a part of strategic planning? Bloomberg example. Isn't it what yeah. encouraging experiments yeah. was a part of their strategy? Yes, this is another good question. Uh, what if you did away with your entire strategic planning process? And what if you just taught everyone in the company to do experiments? This is more or less what, and I forget his name, did at the big casino in Las Vegas. And uh, he just took all his employees to, I wish I could remember the name of the company, uh, uh, and taught them how to do experiments and taught them statistics and gave them the resources available to them to analyze and to produce data, to run a control group with every experiments and just let his employees do whatever experiment they wanted. Uh, no group, no meetings, no plan. Uh, certainly when you're doing planning, you're doing research and you're studying the experiments. But when you're doing business agility, you're just doing experiments all the time. So look at Google. 20% of any employee's time is dedicated to do anything they want. 
That is not strategic planning. That's tinkering. And tinkering has produced more of the world's breakthroughs and industries and advances than any planning ever did. Hmm. Uh, David, you there? Hello? David, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so I can move to the next question now? I guess. Okay, uh, another short one. Uh, where would you put Bill Gates, uh, hedgehogs or fox? Yeah. I was afraid somebody was going to ask about Bill Gates. He's a tough one. He, uh, he is a good guy. Um, I, I'm a fan of Bill Gates' intentions. I'm not a fan of Bill Gates' methodologies. Uh, I think that he combines both. It's clear that Steve Jobs was a hedgehog. That's, that's easy. Uh, Steve Ballmer is a clear hedgehog. Bill Gates is a, is a complex person, and uh, you know, he has a good heart. But he also created a company that really dominated by brute force. And a lot of the same can be said of his, uh, his uh, Gates Foundation. So I'm, I'm really a fan of the overall goals. But if you read a book called The Death and Life of the Great American School System, you will see, you will learn about Bill Gates' mistakes. And it's, uh, it's really too bad the, the sort of brute force approach he uses to solving. He's got really important problems that he would like to solve, but he could do a lot more tinkering and a lot more low-level stuff rather than, than top-down. It's a very good question and, and a fascinating area to talk about. Okay, uh, another interesting one. Uh, what is your... Let me, actually, let me do... Uh, Ali, let, let me do one more. I've got... That really leads into one more, so let me just do... going to take three minutes if you don't Sure, mind. sure. Okay. So that's, this is The Halo Effect. This is one of the best business books of all time. If you have not read The Halo Effect, it's required reading on the business agility curriculum. And Rosenzweig here gives dozens of examples of how the press distorts our view of leaders. And that's why Bill Gates is not on here, because he's in the middle. He, he's difficult. But, but the press emphasizes people's personal characteristics that led to the firm's success. They are called natural leaders. They are full of integrity. They're great communicators, blah, blah, blah. Ronald Reagan, by the way, is in the same category here. Many others are. And on the way down, they're called pig-headed, out of touch, misguided, defocused, backwards. The same people, same company. But when the company stopped performing, the press associates the performance with the leader, and they do it both ways, on the way up and on the way down. This gives our image of leaders a very distorted view of what they can control and what they really control. And you can, you can blame Obama for anything you want, but the but presidents of the United States have a lot less control over the world than you think they do. Rosenzweig says that on average, a CEO's personal style accounts for no more than 3% of a company's performance, up or down. Okay, and more questions? Uh, yes, uh, there's an interesting one. Uh, what is your opinion on the myth of statistics or religions of statistics? As it is normally said that statistics looks good, but in reality they also hide the facts. Right, this is perfect. This is an excellent question. Uh, I imagine that the person who asked this was not a PhD in decision science or statistics. Uh, absolutely, statistics is used 95, 98% of the time incorrectly. That's, uh, that's really being using statistics to prove a point you already have in mind. Uh, it's not a myth, it's a tool. And if you use it wrong, you can, you know, or if you use it to your uh, advance your agenda, then uh, you can use it any way you like. Uh, if you want to learn to use it right, number one thing every company should do is hire PhDs in statistics. Uh, most analytics groups do not have PhDs in statistics, and these people are, as far as I'm concerned, the, the people who 
uh, will challenge you most and try to get you to ask open-ended questions and find out what's really going on. Um, uh, most of the rest of people who took a class or two in statistics in college are dangerous and uh, shouldn't be allowed to use statistics. Great book on this is called The Flaw of Averages. It's on my book list uh, by Sam Savage, and it really breaks down uh, how people misuse statistics. Okay. So, David, do you really believe the education system can produce a good PhD in statistics? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a... I'm surprised someone asked this question because it's, it's a question that comes to my mind and that, that means people are really paying attention. So, so the first thing about PhDs is, is the rule is that for every PhD there is an equal and opposite PhD. Uh, so a lot of PhDs are, are really not st statistically significant or helpful. Uh, but I find that people who have PhDs in statistics are different. They are a different kind of human being. They are foxes. No one survives a PhD program in statistic who is a hedgehog or even half a hedgehog. You have to be a fox. And these people are the people I spend my time with and, uh, and try, to, uh, try to get advice from. Um, and by the way, there are some fantastic people who are well versed in statistics and study statistics but don't have the PhD. And they are terrific too. It's, it's not easy, but finding those people one way or another is important. Okay, and let's take one last question. Uh, it's on decision making. Uh, if we want to assess a prospect candidate's skill in decision making, what is the best methodology to do so? Or if you could suggest any particular questions to ask while interviewing the candidate during hiring process? Yeah, there's a book called uh, uh, Half Truth. It was on my list. Half Truths, Lies. Uh, uh, I forget the name of it. Sorry. Oh, I'll just go right here. Uh, an important book on that. Uh, let's see, here's the books. Hard Facts, Dangerous Half-Truths, and Utter Nonsense. Uh, the one thing we've learned when hiring is that you should talk to them about, you should put up scenarios of real problems they might encounter in their job. And you can do this in groups so that you can use cohorts. I talked about that. You can use cohorts of people to attack real problems. You can actually, and they do this at Google, you can say you're going to be here for four days, you know, the people who get through the, the process, and you're all going to work on a particular problem we have, and we're going to see how you work together and what the dynamics are. And we're not just hiring one person. It's not a survivor game. It's a game of seeing who can work together and seeing what the different roles are and, and skills that people bring. So put them in real situations. There are even uh, companies that do mock situational uh, uh, things for in an interview. They'll they'll say, "Okay, here's here's your situation right now. You, th this person who is uh, who's in charge of this that you're uh, has just left, and you're here's his plate. Here's all the things he has to do right now. Uh, what are we going to do about it? And give them a couple of hours of work or an overnight assignment, or make them do ask them to do real work." that lets you see their process. Now, how you evaluate that is something else, and it's, it's tricky. But asking them about their past generally has no correlation. Well, uh, that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. Uh, there have been a lot of comments in terms of people are particularly interested about the links that you mentioned to download the book. So David would appreciate if you could um, post webinar, if you could email it to us, uh, we will further broadcast it to all the attendees, uh, or we yeah. will upload it as a knowledge pack uh, while up, up, uploading your uh, soft copy of the presentation, the yeah. rec recorded version. So we can uh, actually share that link too, and they will be able to find the links towards the books or, or to your website's sure. precise URL. Um, uh, but uh, really, I uh, would like to thank you on behalf of uh, Mile Medina for taking this time and sharing this wonderful, wonderful presentation. And, must say quite a paradigm to me at least uh, uh, and all the comments and questions that I've been receiving it looks like that people were engaged and good to your presentation. Any concluding remarks that you would like to give? Uh, I'll just do the storytelling one uh, briefly. Uh, you know stories are important. People's systems one are used to stories. So use story 
telling to sell, but don't use it to decide what to buy. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, well, well, with that note, uh, I would like to once again thank you, uh, uh, David, especially for your time, and thank you all of those who attended this webinar and for posting these questions and making it an interactive experience for all of us. Uh, I am going to end this webinar, but with the final announcement that please do visit uh, Mile Community, which is community.mile.org. You will be able to download the soft copy of this presentation and watch the recorded version of the webinar in the next two to three days. Uh, uh, we will be rendering this webinar and uploading on our YouTube channel. So uh, uh, please do stay tuned for upcoming webinars on our Mile Community and join us uh, uh, on these free ventures. But um, 